one of the New Testaments. And I'm Genesis chapter 5 in the Old Testament. And I'll read some verses here in a moment. And then over to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. I have an old Scofield Bible. If you do, that's page 1301. And then in Genesis chapter 5, and I'll read some verses here. And then ask if you will uh, to leave your Bibles open. We're going to just talk a little bit about men in our text tonight. And I'm going to try to do some things to help us as we live out these last days. What a joy it is to be with you folks here at the Fellowship Baptist Church. Last time I preached for Brother Kelly, uh, we were on the other side of the track. So, yes, uh, but uh, man, we are the high top right here in this place. This is beautiful. And it smells good. It looks good. I, I like it because it's bright. And uh, the choir did great. And everything's so pretty here. And I'm just excited about your future and what the Lord is doing here in this place. And uh, now I see how the other half. <laughs> this, is this is wonderful. And I'm thankful that you're here tonight as well. I love you, preacher, his wife, and family, and appreciate their faithfulness through the years. Stan and the Brother Kelly, as far as I know, they never changed from the first time I've met uh, to, the, to this present hour. And so I appreciate him and his testimony. And to thank the Lord for this beautiful place and what the Lord is doing here. And this is great. I'm glad you're a part of that. And I pray God will help you and bless you. As you move forward from this point forward. And I'm glad to be here myself tonight. It's always a joy to see Brother Brother Stanley and to be able to fellowship with him. And then I have Brother Greg Paul with me tonight. Brother Greg, I told you when I got up here, I said, I'm going to introduce the old man that I have with me. Yeah. Brother Greg's really not that old. He just had knee surgery. So he, he walks like an old man right now. So I went around trying to help him out of band. He said, shut up and get out of here. So, and I'm glad he rode with me. He can talk. I'm doing all the driving. Man, we get Raleigh and almost come to Springs and Hall. But uh, I'm from way up north from here. And it's a joy to be here tonight. Thank you for being here. I want to read, if you'll just leave your Bibles open. We may have some fun in a moment. But Genesis chapter 5. And I want to begin reading verse 21. Genesis chapter 5 and verse 21. And here's what the Bible says. And Enoch lived sixty and five years and begat Methuselah. And Enoch walked with God after he begat Methuselah three hundred years and begat sons and daughters. And all the days of Enoch were three hundred and sixty and five years. And Enoch was not, uh, I'm sorry, Enoch walked with God and he was not, for God took him. Great text. Now join me in Hebrews chapter 11 because we have just a little bit of a further commentary about the life of Enoch in chapter 11 of the book of Hebrews in verse 5. And this is what we read. By faith, Enoch was translated that he should not see death and was not found because God had translated him for before his translation. If you'll notice this phrase here, he had this testimony. He had this testimony that pleased God. And I want to talk tonight just a little bit on the subject of the testimony of Enoch. The testimony. Of Let's pray. Father, would you bless your word tonight? Thank you for the good singing by the choir and special song tonight. Thank you for letting us be here and shake hands and fellowship on this Wednesday night and meet some more of the family of God. And thank you for this beautiful building. Thank you, Lord, for what's going on in this place. And I, I came tonight, Lord, first of all, I have an invitation from my friend. But Lord, I came tonight to be a blessing. But I can't do that if you don't help me. Lord, you know my mind and my body, and I just pray you touch me and help me tonight. God, would you just help me to say everything I ought to say, and right now blot out of everything in my mind that I shouldn't say. I don't want to hurt anybody, hurt anything, but I want to stand true to the Bible. And I pray you'd help us and open our hearts to receive what you have for us. And that God help us tonight in advance. If anything's done, we'll thank you. Because, Lord, if it's going to get done, you've got to do it. So we just ask you to meet with us, challenge our hearts, and help us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, one of the great one of the great controversies, one of the great mysteries of the Bible is found over the book of Genesis, chapter number 6, when we read in verse number 4 that there were giants in the earth in those days. And a lot of controversy and a lot of mystery surrounds who the giants of Genesis, chapter 6 are. You know, the Bible said the sons of God saw that the daughters were men, and they were fair, and they took unto them wives. And from this, from this relationship was produced a breed of giants that were upon the earth in the days uh, of Noah. I have my 
personal opinion who those giants were. I'm sure Brother Kelly has his opinion of who the giants were of Genesis 6. But I think many times in our attempts to define who the giants of Genesis chapter 6 were, that we overlook the fact that there was a giant in Genesis chapter 5. And unlike the giants of Genesis 6, who we really don't know who they were, we know exactly who the giant of Genesis chapter 5 was. And it was a man by the name of Enoch. And he was a giant of the faith. When I was growing up, I, I'm from Mount Airy, North Carolina, so we're right at the Virginia state line and in the northwestern part of, the, of, of our state. And it's a small town. If you've ever watched the Andy Griffith program, Andy Griffith was from Mount Airy, North Carolina. And so that I think that whole thing was kind of built around our hometown setting. And every morning when I got up as a young kid on our local radio station, WSYD and WPAQ, they had what they called the obituary column of the hour. Of, of the hour, of the hour. And every morning when I woke up, woke up, my mom had the obituaries on, and we listened to that every morning while we were getting ready to go to school. And what they did was they just read off all the obituaries that was in the paper. Anybody that died, I don't guess they do that down here. But, uh, but, and it was such a joy to wake up every morning and to find out who had died the night before. And it told about their funeral and who their wife and their husband was and their children and so forth. And it was called the obituary call, the obituaries of the hour is what they call it. Well, in Genesis chapter 5, we have what is called by many the obituary column of the Bible. Because no less than eight times in Genesis chapter 5, we read the phrase, and he died. And that's led many to say that Genesis chapter 5 is the obituary column of the Bible. Let me tell you what Genesis chapter 5 really is. It is proof, it is proof positive that what God said can be trusted yeah. and what the devil says can always be counted as a lie. Yes, you see, back in Genesis chapter number 3, God or told Adam and Eve not to eat of the tree of knowledge of good and of evil, for in the day that they ate thereof, that they were going to die. Well, along comes the devil, and the first thing he says to Eve is, Eve, ye shall not surely die. But now we find in Genesis chapter 5 that just as God said, it played out because man began to die. Yeah, right. so the Bible said, wherefore is by sin. One man sin entered into the world right. and death by sin. So death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 15, 22, as in Adam all die, right. even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So we read here in Genesis chapter 5 that God said that man was going to die. The devil said that man is not going to die. That God can be trusted. And the devil is always alive. And yet right in the middle of what we would call the obituary column of the Bible, we read about a man who didn't die. In fact, the Bible said in Genesis 5, 24, that he walked with God and he was not, for God took him. There was one man out of the masses, the people of that day, who got out of this world without dying, and his name was Enoch. You know, I guess Enoch really is a picture of people like you and me that will be taken off the earth before the judgment of God began. Aren't you glad that we believe in the pre-tribulation rapture? Hey, I don't find any comfort. I find no comfort whatsoever in a mid-tribulation rapture. I sure find no comfort in a post-tribulation rapture. But I sure like the idea that Jesus is going to come and take us off the earth before the judgment of God comes on the earth. And that is a picture of the life of Eden. Just as Noah, a picture of the nation of Israel, is going to be preserved supernaturally through the time of judgment and the waters of judgment that comes upon the earth, then Enoch is a picture of those of us that are going to be taken off the earth before the judgment of God ever comes upon the earth. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. Well, the Bible said in our text about this man by the name of Enoch. Now, there are two great statements that are made about his life. Look, if you will, in Genesis 5, and notice in verse number 24, we're told that Enoch walked with God. What a great statement to be made about anybody that they walked with God. And then the second statement is over in Hebrews chapter 11, where the Bible said that he had this testimony that he pleased God. You know, if there's two things you and I ought to really be striving to do as we live out these last days, 
is to number one, walk with God. Yes. And number two, have a testimony yes. right, that we please. Yes. Now I think if Enoch could do it back in those days, surely you and me could do it in right. these last days in which you and I are living. I happen to believe that you and I are living in the last days, yes. don't you? In fact, I think we probably left the period of the last days and we moved into the period of the last of the last day. Friend, I'm telling you, we're getting ready to leave out of here. But as we live out these last days, as we live out these revelation times that we're living in, but we ought to try our best to walk with God and have a testimony as we please God. And if Enoch can do it, so can you and so can I. You know, really, we can really talk about a whole lot about Enoch. For instance, we can talk a little bit about the times of Enoch. Enoch lived at the times before the judgment of the flood upon the earth. You know, Jesus actually said that before he returns, the times on the earth are going to pick up the characteristics similar to the times in which Enoch lived in the days prior to the days of Noah and the flood upon the earth. Jesus talked about that in Matthew 24 when he talked about in the last days that men would be eating and drinking and marry and give it in marriage. We can talk about the times of Enoch because the times that Enoch lived in yeah, right. are similar to the times in which you and I are living in. We can talk not only about the times of Enoch, hey, we can talk about the turnabout of Enoch. Yeah, the Bible talks about that old Enoch was just walking along for the first 65 years of his life, but then there came a turnabout. Aren't you glad that there came a turnabout in your life? Yes, yes, sir. We can talk about the times of Eden. We can talk about the turnabout of Eden. What about this? We can talk about the translation of Eden. Why the Bible said that he was translated, that he should not see that. I like that word translated. It's where we get our English word metamorphosis from. You think back to your seventh grade science or biology class, you may remember that metamorphosis is what a caterpillar goes through when he spins this cocoon and then he crawls inside of this cocoon and then several days later he emerges from that cocoon not in the ugly body of a caterpillar but in the beautiful body of a butterfly. Yeah. Somebody said, where'd that come from? It was there all the time. It was just housed inside the body of a caterpillar. But I'm going to tell you something tonight. We're in a caterpillar body right now. Yeah. But I think on some of these days, between here and yonder, yeah. we're going to go through yeah. the process of metamorphosis. We're going to be translated. Yeah. And on the other side, we're going to have the mind of Christ. Yeah. And the yeah. of Somebody said, where'd that come from? It was there from the time we got saved by the yeah. grace of God. We just had to go through the process of the rapture to get to the other side. Yeah. You know, we can talk about the translation. But I really want to focus in, if I may, for just a few moments on that ball, the testimony of Enoch. You know everybody in this room tonight's got a testimony. Yes, Either a good testimony or, as the case may be, a bad testimony. You know, some of us in here, and I don't know all of us are like this, but all of us in here hopefully have a good testimony that we are actually using our testimony to draw others, to attract others to the Lord Jesus. But there, of course, we know there are people in this world who name the name of Christ, but they have a bad testimony. Yep. And by their lives and the things they do and the way they live, they're not attracting people to Jesus. They're, uh, they're repelling people away from Christ. Well, you and I ought to strive in these last days to have the kind of testimony where we're attracting people to Jesus. I don't know about you, but I don't want some lost person to trip over the, uh, the failures of my life and the wind-ups uh, in hell and, and at the great platform judgment I had to point a finger at somebody like me and said, but they never told me and they never they were no different than I were. We ought to do our best to have a testimony that we please God. Everybody in this room has a testimony. Now sometimes if we're not careful we think that a testimony is something that we say. I don't know and I'm sure it happens here but at our church sometime before I get up and preach or maybe while I'm getting ready to preach, somebody would stand up and say, hey, preacher, can I, can I, can I say a word for, for, for the Lord? Yeah. And we say, boy, I'll tell you what, man, we had a good testimony service yeah. tonight. Yeah. But can I tell you something? Your testimony is more than what you say. Yes. Yeah. Your testimony is what you are outside the yes. walls of the house of God. Your testimony is what you are when you walk into where you work at. 
Your testimony is what you are when you live out the Christian life in your neighborhood. Your testimony is what you are when you head off to school uh, right. in the morning or something when school starts back up again. Our testimony is more than what we say. It is in reality who and what we are. What kind of a testimony do you have to do? But now look this way. And like, this is my sermon and I'm wrapping this thing up. But I got to think about that word testimony. Because in reality, a testimony is first a test and then an emotion. Right. You see, if you're going to have a the kind of test emotion that pleases God, you're going to have to pass the test. A test emotion. And I got to look at the life of, Gen uh, of Enoch here in Genesis chapter 5. The Bible tells us he had a testimony that pleased God. So evidently, he passed the test and he pleased God. But there were three tests that his testimony had to go through. See, if you don't agree with this, let me give them to you quickly. First of all, I thought about number one, how that Enoch's testimony, number one, passed the test of time. The test of time. Now, I want you to look at our text tonight and, and notice that when we first meet Enoch, he was at the age of 65 years old. Look at verse 21. The Bible said that Enoch lived 60 and 5 years. So when we first meet Enoch, he is 65 years old. Now, by the way, I think Enoch was like everybody else in Genesis chapter 5 when we first meet him. There's no pursuit. There's no hunger. There's no desire for the things of God. He's just living day by day. He's just walking through life. He's just trying to get through. If you were to ask him what he's going to do, he said, I'm going to try to live, try to make a living for my family, and then just someday, I'm going to die. But something happened to old Enoch when he was 65 years old. And if I can say it like this, let, let, me, let me say it like this. At the age of 65 years old, Enoch walked in to the family of God. That's what that. Look at chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 21. Enoch lived 65 years and begat Methuselah. Now, something happened to Enoch when that baby was born. Now, you and I know that Methuselah is the oldest person in, in the Bible. He was 969 years old before he died. But more than that, I think that when that baby was born, that God broke through the darkness and the deadness of Enoch's soul, and God revealed to Enoch that judgment was about to come upon the earth. And God used that message of judgment to bring Enoch into the family of God. You say, preacher, I'm confused by all that. Let me see if I'm clear it up for you. You know, in, in Bible days and in, in, in our Bible, names mean something. Yeah, right. You understand that, don't right. you? I heard about this uh, old boy and his wife one night, and they were laying in the bed. They were watching TV. It was kind of getting on up late at night. So they had all the lights off, Brother Stanley, and they were just laying there in the bed just watching TV before they went off to sleep, and a burglar broke into their house. Well, when he walked into the bedroom, had his gun in his hand, he was just as surprised to see the man in the wife laying in the bed as they were to see him. And when they saw him, it startled them. When he saw them, it startled him. But he realized there were some witnesses to the crime. So he looked at him and he said, you know, I'm going to have to kill you now because you are a, a witness to my wife in this home. So I'm going to kill you. So he looked at the wife and he said, before I kill you, I want to find out what your name is. So he looked at her and said, now what's your name? She said, uh, my name's Elizabeth. He said, I can't kill you. He said, my mom's name was Elizabeth. I can't kill you. No way I can kill you. So he took the gun and he pointed the man. He said, what's your name? The man said, my name's Harry. But my friends call me Elizabeth. <laughs> <laughs> See, by the way, name's Mitzah. And if you look up the word Methuselah or the name Methuselah, here's what it means. When he is gone, it will come. You say, preacher, what's the it? It's the flood. Yeah, right. And God used the message of judgment to bring Eden into yes. the family of God. Now, one of the things, preacher, that we're hearing in our day is, hey, let's don't be judgment preachers anymore. Yeah, right. Hey, let's don't stand up and talk about power. Right. Let's don't right. stand up and talk about judgment. Let's don't stand up and talk about the tribulations. Let's just, when people come to church, let's be positive. Let's be encouraging. Let's be uplifting. Let's just tell them how wonderful everything is. But I'm going to tell you something, friend. That kind of preaching didn't break me in. Oh, let me tell you what I got to say about this. Because some old man stood up and told me things that 
26 years old today. <laughs> Shut up. Like I say, when I was 16 years old, and I'm 56, you do the math now, I've been saved for 40 years. And I have grown over these, these 40 years. I have really grown to, to love and appreciate the grace of God and the love of God. Now that I'm on the other side of Calvary, man, I thank God that he loves me. Yes. I thank God for his yes. grace. Yes. And I'll tell you what it was that brought me to Calvary. It wasn't necessarily the love of God. And I mean no disrespect to that. Yes. But it was the old fashioned yes. yes. of the church of God that brought me into the family yes. of God. I'm telling you, he didn't walk in. Now because of the preaching, the message of judgment. Yeah. And don't you get mad at your preacher when he's oh. preaching. Pray for him. You pray for lost people. Yeah. Because I'm here to tell you what will get people into the family of God is still the old fashioned message of judgment. It brought Enoch in. And thank God it'll bring them. Yeah. I said that to say this Enoch walked in at the age of 65. But then if you look at our text, look at verse 24, verse 23. Enoch walked out. At the age of 365. Look again at that text, verse 23. All the days of Enoch were 365 years. So the Bible says when he was 365 years old, that he was and he was not. You say, what happened? God took him. Well, aren't you glad God's getting ready to yeah. take us? Amen. Amen. Yes, sir. I heard my preacher stand up in the mountains one time. Here's what he said. He said, when Jesus comes, it's going to be atmosphere, hemisphere, stratosphere, and out of here. <laughs> God's going to, God's going to take us. Hey, hey brother, I'm telling you, if you walk in, hey, we're getting ready to walk out. Yeah, man. Yes, sir. Good. If you walk in, if you've been born again, washed in the blood of Jesus, and dwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, I'm here to tell you, it ain't going to be long. But we're walking out. I know. I used to think, I used to think, Brother Stan, I knew exactly what the Lord was going to say when he come back. I used to think I had a day. I don't know. I just always thought it was going to be that Revelation 4.1 text. John said, after this, I looked and the whole door was open in heaven. And the first, first voice I heard, which spake unto me, said, come up here. I thought, that's it. Yeah. When Jesus comes, what he's going to say, we know there's going to be a shout and the voice of the archangel. And I thought Jesus is going to shout, come up, healer. Change your mind. I don't think he's going to say that. You know what I think he's going to say now? Attention, Walmart shoppers. <laughs> <laughs> because we all go to Walmart. If it wasn't for the Eddie Griffin program at Walmart, I don't know what the independent Baptist would do. Yeah. Right. We can't do anything else because everything else is sin. Yeah. Right. Come on. But I tell you what happened to him. He walked in at 365, uh, at 65, and he walked out at 365. We're <laughs> getting ready to walk. Yes, sir. Hey, can you just go? I just keep thinking about this. You know, every day, you know, God said, now when he's gone, it's going to come. The judgment, the flood is going to come. And you do the Bible math, and you'll find out the year that Methuselah died is the year that the flood upon the earth came. Oh, so, yeah. As God said it would happen. I just get thinking about this. What if old, what if old Methuselah was late, was late and the school bus broke down one day after school? And he had walked in. Man, he said, Mama, where are the losers? He said, I ain't seen him. He's gone. I don't know what happened to him. He's supposed to be here. He's not here. Can't you see him? He's getting all torn up now. Because he said, oh, my goodness, is it about to happen? Yeah, what about that? Yeah, he walked in. He walked out. But what that means is this. If he walked in at 65, and he walked out at 365, what that means is, for 300 years, he walked on. What about that? What about that? Yes, sir. Hey, walking in, that's salvation. Hey, walking out, that's glorification. But walking on, that's dedication. Yeah. Hey, I'll tell you something. There's not a whole lot of dedication much among the God of God. Right. In fact, here's what I find. More people are interested in walking off. Yeah, yeah. Right. And walking and, and walking, walking off, then we are walking on. Yeah, yeah. Right. But for 300 years, Enoch walked on. I guess we can 
say it like this. Boy's testimony stood the test of time. Yes. Can't you see it when he was 65 and that baby was born? And he's got, he's got blue flamingo stuck in his yard and a blue ribbon on the mailbox. And he goes down to the general store and he's passing out blue bubble gum cigars because he had a baby boy. And he walked in that morning down there and they're playing checkers over at the pickle barrel and eating crackers. And they're playing over there and he said, hey, hey boys, I had a, I had a, I had a son last night. Here's y'all a blue bubble gum cigar. I had a boy. I had, and by the way, something else happened last night. I got saved yeah. by the grace of God. Yeah. And he had walked off. Walked on out of the store. Can't you see that crowd sitting around the big bar and said, it won't last. No, oh, that's what they said. I give him two weeks, he'll be back cussing you. Yeah. I give him three weeks, he'll be back smoking weed. Yeah. Yeah. Come on. Hey, I give him a month, he'll be back down here to do drop dead in, drinking liquor with us. Yeah. I give him another month, he'll be sitting up playing cards with us all night. Hey, I give him another month, he'll be buying lottery tickets. Yeah. Hey, I give him another month, he'll be back like he used to have yeah. like yeah. for free. But uh, it, during that, that time, when I got saved at 16, and the Lord called me to preach when I was 18, you got to understand, I was very, very fast. Well, I still have problems with that sometimes. Sometimes I think, well, you, you can't mistake being bashful for being stuck up, snooty. And I'm not snooty, and I'm not stuck up. I'm just bashful. So when I get around the crowd, Sometimes the, I just find me a chair somewhere over in the corner, and I just find listening to what everybody else is saying. I don't have to say a whole lot, right? And when my family comes to my house, I have three kids, three grandkids, and when they all come to my house, you can ask my wife. I'll get me a chair over in the corner somewhere. I'll play with the grandbabies, but I say got a lot to say. I just listen to what they say. We went to eat with some preachers yesterday. We were sitting there eating, and man, they were just talking up the storms. I was sitting over there by myself. I, I just, I, I'm very awkward in that kind of a setting. I'm very bad. And I never will forget when God called me to preach. We had a, a church similar to this with two sections of you. And I was sitting over there on this side, about that second window up from the back. When God called me for 18 years old, you've got to understand, I wouldn't even look in the face and talk to you. I mean, if I was going to talk to you, here's how I'd talk to you. Bashful, I mean, man, just, just, uh, uh, what socially awkward is that? What they say, mentally retarded. <laughs> <laughs> when I was that, I was, I was terrible. I was bad, really bad. And God, you don't think God has a sense of humor? God calls somebody like me to preach. That tells you God's got a sense of humor. So that night it was a Friday night of revival meeting, fall revival meeting. James Graham was up preaching. And uh, he got to talk about, man, I know God's calling somebody to preach. Boy, I've been wrestling with it for weeks. And, man, maybe your whole revival of it because you won't surrender to God. So I said, okay, man, I'm not going to be held accountable for this thing. So I left it. I left the people right down the aisle and came about right here and got on my knees. And I said, okay, God, you know what you're getting. And I think you're making a big mistake, Lord. But if that's what you want, I'll, I'll do my best. And about that time, one of the men in our church, his name was Joe Questenbury, came up to me, put his arm around me, and he said, Brother Tim, can I help you pray about something? And I said, Brother Joe, the Lord has called me to preach. And I was really needing a word of encouragement about that time. And you know what he said to me? Are you sure? That's what he said. And I said, well, I'm sure as I can be. He said, don't you say a word till you talk to the preacher. So right after service, I made a beeline for our pastor. And I went to our pastor, Brother Bill, and I said, Brother Bill, can I speak to you for just a moment? And he said, well, sure. We had a little area similar to that. We walked back, get married, got in such a room, and I shut the door. He said, what's going on? I said, Brother Bill, my pastor, the Lord has called me to preach. You know what my pastor said to me? Are you sure? <laughs> I mean, I needed some encouragement about that. 
But here's what he said to me. He said, the Lord's called you to preach. I'm on. We're going to try this thing out. So he said, he gave me a, a Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. This was Halloween night. And Wednesday night before Thanksgiving, he said, I want you to preach your first message. Well, I got up that night, and I preached about three or four minutes. I know some people wish I could go back and do three or four minutes. <laughs> I preached that night, preached everything I knew, some things I wasn't sure of, but I preached them all. When I got done, Brother Bill said, I'm going to have Brother Tim stand out front. Y'all come around and shake his hand and tell him what a great first message that people come by and shook my hand. Well, after all that was done, I started to walk out the side door <coughs> and get in the car. And there was an old retired preacher, Brother Frank Meadows, pastor in Flint, Michigan. He, would, he preached up there for years, had a big church up there, and he was retired, moved down here. And one of our deacons, Harvey Johnson, started out the side door, and I was right behind him. And they were talking about God calling me to preach. And I never will forget it. Harvey Johnson looked over at Frank Meadows, and he said this. And I was hearing this. They didn't go off fire. He said this. You know, it's kind of hard to believe that God would call somebody like Frank Pettis looked him right back in the face, not even to realize I was listening. Here's what he said. He said, well, I guess I'm going to say it. Brother Stanley, God used that that night to, to, to burn something into my heart that I want people to know that I would much. I may be backward and bashful, and I don't have a lot of gifts to offer. I'm not some great kind of orator. I'm not some pulpiteer, but I tell you what, for the last how many ever years of my life, hey, I, wanted one, I wanted people to know one thing. Hey, that time will tell on me and what God done in my heart. That's right. It's real. Yeah. Hey, brother, I want to walk home. Yeah. I want to walk home. Yeah. Yeah. Since I walked in, thank God. Let's walk home. Yeah. 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 hey, what's the time? Yeah. Tell about you. Yes, sir. That's good. Yeah. Well, I tell you what, one thing I know, this church is like our church. And you can remember folks who used to settle with you yeah, where you right. sat. Yeah, and what happened to them? They didn't walk on, they walked off. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Hey, evidently, I'm not judging anybody. God's the judge. He'll straighten all that out, either the judgment seat or the great white throne. I get it. But I'm here to tell you, friend, I want it when they walk by my casket and look at my dead oh. legs. I want to be able to say one thing. By the help of the grace of God, yeah. he walked out. Yeah. somebody else. Right. 
and or they're 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 on some kind of pornographic website. Listen, we're living in days when, when wickedness and evil is, is at the at the tips of your fingers. Yeah. Phone out, yeah. punch in, tap on an app, get, get on the internet. Nobody will ever know. Those are the days you and I are living. All right. But in the midst of all that, in Enoch's day, in the middle of all that, while they were pursuing their liquor and their lust and their lifestyle, there was one old boy who made up his mind yeah. that he was going to march yes. to the beat of a different hey, 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 He was not going to drink their liquor. He was not going to cuss their language. He was not going to live in their, in their lust in the worst imaginable day on the earth. There was one old boy that made up his mind that by the help and the grace of God, in the middle of all that, he was going to have a testimony that by God. Yeah. And by the way, can I say this? He didn't have a whole lot of encouragement. Can I just remind you, there wasn't no church back in Enoch's day. There wasn't no Wednesday nights of preaching in June. Hey, there wasn't no team camp meetings. There were no revival meetings going on. Hey, there were no ladies' jubilees. Hey, there was no men's conferences and men's meetings. And by, hey, there were no radio stations he could pick up some preaching on. Hey, there was no internet he could serve and find a message from some great preacher. There was none of that. But in the midst of all that, without any church, without any church standing stand behind it, thank God there was a man that made up his mind. Live, die, sing, or swim. Get out of die, sing. He was going to move with God and have a testimony that pleased me. Good. And if he did, I like that. So can you. Yes, God. And so can I. Hey. Listen, we're living in days of great anarchy in our country. I'm so glad you're in church. Don't be mad at me, but aren't you glad you're missing those Democratic debates tonight? Yes! Come on! I told Brother Craig, I'm so sorry, but I'm taking you away from the ability to watch the Democratic debate. We're going to try to pick it up on the radio going up the road. I'm kidding, of course. But I mean, we're living in days when there's an anarchy in our country. Are we not? Who ever, lived, who ever thought we'd live to see what's happening in America happen right before our very eyes? Our country is drifting farther and farther and distances and distancing itself further and further away from God. And we're seeing anarchy rise up in our streets. And we're seeing uh, we're seeing civil unrest and, and we're seeing all kind of ungodliness killing babies right up to the very